The American justice, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, was once asked, when will there be enough women on the Supreme Court? Her answer, when there are nine. RBG confesses people are shocked to hear that answer, but then she adds, there were always nine men, and nobody ever raised a question about that. Fortunately, the justice system is no longer the old boys club it once was. A new book chronicles some of the changes to that club as 18 women share their experiences in Women in Criminal Justice, True Cases by and About Canadian Women and the Law, and it brings Jennifer Briscoe, formerly from the Public Prosecution Service of Canada, now a sole practitioner, and Jill Presser, criminal defense lawyer with Presser Barristers, to our studio. Nice to have you both here. Nice to be here. Thank now, you. if we were talking about the Canadian justice system, say, 50 years ago, chances are you two would be men, and chances are we would be complaining about the fact that there were probably only one or two women in your office um, who dared to join the old boys club. How do you think, Jill, start us off here, how do you think the Canadian justice system is different because it is now populated with many more female lawyers and judges. So Steve, I would, to start off, uh, disagree with the fact that there would even be two women in an office of criminal defense lawyers 50 years ago. Not even that many. Maybe in supporting roles, support mm -hmm. staff, receptionist, but not as lawyers. So 50 years ago, there were probably none at all. Um, what's different now is that we do have many more women in the criminal bar. We know that uh, men and women enter our bar in roughly equal numbers and remain roughly in equal numbers for the fir first five years of practice. But after that, women drop off when it's time to have children. They leave the practice of criminal defense and they don't come back. So one of the things, Jennifer, we've got to figure out is how to get them to stay? How to get them to stay is a problem. We see at times that uh, people leave private practice to join the Crown's office because that's a place where there seems to be more of the, the life balance along with the career. Um, so that's one of the avenues that people seem to seek out. Uh, but it is a problem. It's, it's an ongoing problem that the Law Society is trying to deal with as well. You two uh, obviously wrote two of the chapters in this book, Women in Criminal Justice. And I want, to, I want to just sort of tap into your respective experiences here. So, Jennifer, I'm going to start with you. So, Jill, get comfortable for a second here, because I was really fascinated by the fact that for many, many, many years in a row now, you have gone to the far north of this country to do your thing. When did you first start to do that? I started to do that in the late 80s. I was encouraged greatly by the people that I worked with to do it. Um, and I was fascinated by, of course, our, our country and how vast it is and how different the North was. Because you're from down here. Because I'm from Montreal. I grew up in Montreal, lived in Ottawa, lived in Toronto, practiced in all of those three places. And what and was your job supposed to be going up there? My job initially was to go out to Whitehorse the first time and it was to do a trial and I believe I was being called upon because I was bilingual. So I went out to do a French jury trial. And Were you the Crown? I was the Crown. Mm -hmm. And I was called back on several occasions to do other cases. And then I had this opportunity to go to Old Crow. They needed somebody to fly into that community. And I jumped at it because while I thought Whitehorse was a fantastic experience, going that much farther north was quite astounding. How much further north is that? Well, it's a good 800 kilometers. It's a couple of hours in a very small, scary plane <laughs> north of where I was. <laughs> Uh, to what was a place that I could not drive home from. And how many years consecutively did you continue to go up north? I did it throughout my career. So 30 years? 30 years. How different did the courtroom up there look from one that you would have practiced in down here? Well, there is no real courtroom. So the first one that I, I went to uh, at Old Crow was this, essentially a, a community center. Uh, it had the photos of all the elders around us and it was just put together. So we arrive, the judge, the translator, the clerk, the defense counsel, and we set up in there and then begins the process of starting to call the list and then going on to proceed to do trials. Um, so it's very different. It's, it's not set up, in other words. Have you ever had a case in Toronto <clears throat> where somebody broke into the courtroom, announced that somebody had tipped their canoe in Lake Ontario, <laughs> had everybody rush out of the courtroom in order to help save that person? 
No, I can't <laughs> say that. But that did Wait, happen that, in the north. That did. I've had people jump out of the box and come running either at a judge or at a crown or council, but I've never had a scenario like that. Was it unusual for a family? You had to deal with some, obviously, some very, very tough cases. Was it unusual for a family to refuse to testify against, say, an abusive husband or father because if they successfully prosecuted him and he ended up in jail, the family would no longer eat because oh, there was your hunter. That was quite common, and that is mm. quite common because they do live off, many people do live off the land. It's supplemented, of course, with income and purchasing some food, but for the most part, people are hunting and fishing. So without that person, it is very problematic. So they resist uh, testifying, and it's, it's, it's a difficult job for the Crown to assess how to proceed in those cases. I was going to ask you, how do you, how do you handle that? Because on the one hand, you're, you know, you want justice. You want justice. On the other hand, you know, if the family doesn't eat anymore because the husband's in jail, that is a problem. Mm -hmm. So in those instances, obviously, it depends on the kinds of injuries that you've got. And you also are looking to see what kind of support there is for the female in the community. Um, and when I started out, we, we didn't have court workers. But as we moved along, we did have victim services. So you rely heavily on those individuals to figure out, because they are from the communities, uh, who is safe, who isn't, what, what cases you can negotiate some sort of agreement between the parties and which ones have to be prosecuted. I want to read an excerpt from your chapter here, OK? Right. Sheldon, if you would, let's bring the graphic up. Elders are the core of each community there. They embody, preserve, and enhance the culture and important traditions. They are the key to any acceptance of a circuit court. Learning to respect them enhances respect for the rule of law being viable in their communities. I can't help but think of how often in criminal justice in the South, in the big cities, the demonstrative absence of an elder results in the missing compass in many lives. Is that something you think we could do something about here in the South? Uh, I do. I think that people shun, in some ways, the criminal justice system. They're afraid of it. Uh, you do have families that gather and who do come and support uh, a member of their family, but you don't have that same um, thing that you have in the North. You don't have the elders that come and pass on their wisdom and suggest more appropriate course of action for people. And I, and I think that kind of support is really, really important as part of the process of improving as opposed to simply setting out to punish um, individuals because you need the rehabilitation. You want people to be functioning properly in society. You want them to be able to go back to their families. So the use of elders in the North is really helpful. Something along those lines is missing here. And I, I certainly have my share of experiences doing large cases with guns and gangs where you looked out in the courtroom and saw no one. No one to support uh, some very young males who might have chosen a different path or might have some future Future if there was that kind of support. Do First Nations elders here in the South play that kind of a role here in the South? Not quite the same way. There, there are uh, services available. There's a glad you court. So there, there are spe specialized courts uh, in Toronto that deal with Indigenous people, and they have the support that way. Uh, but it doesn't play out quite the same way as in the North. You, I, I think you've described in the book a court system which is very much integrated into everyday life up there in a way that it isn't here. Can you help us understand that better? Well, if you think about it, some of the communities I went into were possibly up to a thousand people, let's say. Those individuals, one or two or 20 people that happen to be on the docket who are charged with offenses, need to be able to stay in that community. You don't want to be removing them from the community. So the significance of the, the community, their involvement and knowing that that person's going to stay within the community is really important. You don't get that same sense when you're in a city with three million people that the, the significance of each individual is quite as important, although everybody's life is important, mm -hmm. obviously. Just finally, what have you got on your mantle at home? Oh, I have a beautiful drummer that was made, and uh, it's it's my symbol for justice in the north, as as I I say in the book. It uh, it's a symbol of drumming and singing, um, which is very much an experience that I had in the north of of watching that, of sharing that that tradition, um, and uh, yeah, it's lovely to work, look at. Okay. Jennifer, you get comfortable. Now, Jill, you and I are going to talk about your chapter. And I want to start with a case that, that is, uh, you know, integral to the chapter you describe. A guy by the name of Josh DeHollis, is that how he says his name? Yep. Tell us about that case. 
So that was a case where Mr. Dow Hollis, who was um, an HIV positive gay man, was charged with some aggravated sexual assaults coming out of the bathhouse scene in Toronto. He was tried in Toronto in front of a jury, and he, um, uh, it was, a, in my opinion, a, an extremely unfair trial. The they witnesses, found him guilty. They did find him guilty, and subsequent to his conviction, it became evident that the jury foreman went on radio and made a bunch of homophobic jokes a number of times, both before and after conviction. On a sort of a shock jock morning radio show. Exactly. So you heard this tape and you heard the, the homophobic slurs that were a part of this routine. Correct. So what did that prompt you to do? So I represented Mr. Dow Hollis on an appeal of his conviction to the Court of Appeal for Ontario. And our position in that court was that there, the trial was unfair or appeared to be unfair by reason of homophobic bias. And we asked the Court of Appeal to overturn Mr. Dow Hollis's conviction on the basis of this very corrosive homophobic bias in a juror. Okay, we're gonna hold off. I don't wanna give away the whole story just yet because okay. we'll hold off on what the ultimate verdict was. You obviously want to represent all of your clients well, but you tell us in your chapter that this particular case and this particular defendant resonated with you in a particular way. How come? He did. Um, partly it was because uh, I really wanted to see justice done for members of the LGBTQ plus communities in Canada, but especially because I'm the mother of a queer daughter. And so issues around bias against queer people in our system really resonate for me personally, not just as a lawyer. As you were preparing for the appeal, your daughter, you tell us, went through kind of a tough breakup. She did. In her life, and you found yourself in the classic situation of needing to prepare significantly for your client and yet be there for your kid. And you tell us in your chapter that the, I think you call it mummy guilt. Yes. The mummy guilt for female criminal lawyers is way more intense than it is for anybody else. How come? I think it's more in, I mean, I think all working women um, who have children do experience mommy guilt. I think it's particularly intense for women criminal lawyers because of the intensity of the work that we do. Uh, we represent people often at the worst point in time in their lives. They are often incredibly vulnerable. We often represent people who are socioeconomically disadvantaged, who have mental health issues, who are vulnerable in all kinds of ways. Their liberty is on the line. Sometimes also their reputation, their jobs, their family connections, they need us very, very badly. Their need is great. And therefore the hours are long and grueling. Uh, the work is intense, the pressure is severe, and it's very hard to balance those extraordinary needs of our clients with the everyday needs of raising children. And how did you do it? Well, probably not very well, <laughs> Steve. And I bet your kids wouldn't say that. Well, I'm not sure. Um, it, uh, it was a struggle to juggle, and it remains a struggle to juggle, although both of my kids are teenagers now. Um, I really sort of tried to do everything and always had the feeling that I never did anything very well. So I lawyered to the best and still lawyer to the best of my ability and parented to the best of my ability. And probably what resulted was a bit of a muddly mess of doing everything okay. <laughs> well, you write in the book, the fact that I have a supportive spouse who is the father of my children has not solved these challenges. Why do you think not? I think because of how we're socialized, certainly people in, in our generation, women still do tend to be primary caregivers. Even in families where both, um, and I'm talking about heterosexual families, where both uh, uh, mother, woman, and husband, man, are both working outside the home because of how we've been socialized and because of um, prevailing social paradigms about what it is to be a woman and what it is to be a man, women remain predominantly primary caregivers to children. And, and our family was no exception. Our kids looked to me first always and leaned on me hardest, although both of their parents were working. When your daughter was five years old, 
she wrote out a prayer at yes, school. Yes. What did she pray for? Uh, my, this was actually the younger daughter, so not the oh. one who's the focus of the chapter, but um, she wrote out a prayer as I was absent um, because I was dealing with an arrest call in the hallway outside her classroom and all of her classmates had their parents present. I was in the hall dealing with an arrest and I came in to find that she had written a prayer that said, Dear God, please make my mama work less. I miss her. And how did you take that when you found out? Well, I, um, I cried, but tried not to show her I was crying. But uh, it was ex extraordinarily painful. Your older daughter once told you she was going to commit a crime because... Because maybe that way I would pay more attention to her <laughs> as I do to my clients. Which begs the obvious question, why not scale back? Why not work part-time? Why not figure out a different way? You know, that's a really good question. Um, this kind of work is very, criminal defense work is very hard to do part-time. It's hard to be in with one foot. It's one of those things where you're sort of in for a penny, in for a pound. And part of that, Steve, is about the economics of the business. When you uh, pay law society fees and insurance and rent an office and have an assistant, the overhead is steep. And when you defend people charged with crimes, you end up taking legal aid certificates, which are not very lucrative. The margins are slim. And in order to cover your overhead and make a, a living wage, you end up having to do a volume of work to support yourself and your family that really is incompatible with family life. So the economics just don't work. That's right. Trying to do it that way. Let's come full circle. How did things work out for Josh, your client? I'm very pleased to say that Josh Dow Hollis won his appeal. The court overturned the conviction on the basis of the apparent homophobic bias of the juror. That court ordered a new trial for Josh Dow Hollis, but the Crown elected not to re-prosecute. So I feel there was vindication for him personally, as well as, importantly, vindication for LGBTQ plus people. The court recognized that, anti, that homophobic bias is as corrosive in the justice system as other forms of bias like racism. And everything worked out well for my daughter, too. Well, I think that's probably true because, and we didn't set this up and you don't know this is coming, but I'm going to ask you to read something here. Oh, my. You got it in the book. She wrote you a note. She did. Read away. On, uh, I'm going to have to put on the glasses. On the morning of the Dow Hollis appeal, I was, you know, had been racked with guilt, torn from her as she grieved her first big heartbreak and uh, prepping for this big, big appeal. And um, on the morning of that appeal, she handed me a note. And the note says, Dear Mama, good luck in court today and every other day. I know you are, are working to make this country a more just place. I'm proud of you and hope to do something as meaningful with my life as you've done with yours. I love you. And I put that note in the pocket of my court robes. You know, we wear robes and vests. It's in my uh, waistcoat pocket. And it is still there with me. So every time I go to court, I have her note and her sentiments with me to remind me um, that she and my other daughter are with me and the lessons that I've learned as a mother enrich and enhance me as a lawyer and maybe vice versa. When you read that note for the first time, how did you react? Um, I seem to be talking a lot about crying, but uh, <laughs> I guess I do do a lot of crying. I, I cried and I was delighted and relieved. I mean, if you're a parent, it doesn't get better than that. No, nope. sure doesn't. Hmm. Well, okay, Jennifer, that story, uh, much of what Jill talked about there, points to whether it is actually possible for the legal profession, for the justice system, to do things differently and accommodate people who have, you know, other needs besides just putting in 80 or 90 hours a week on the job, um, to lead more balanced lives so fewer women leave the profession. Is it possible to achieve that mission? It's, it's a tough balance. Uh, I think back on the opportunities I was given, and I recall when I was 
transferring here to Toronto from Montreal, uh, I came and I had a uh, director who was a female lawyer. Uh, she was very supportive of people that had families, and I'm, that's not to say that her predecessor hadn't been, but it, it seemed particular to her. Um, and at one point, she approached me about taking on the job of being the team leader, uh, manager at Old City Hall, which at the time was the largest intake court in Canada. And I remember f feeling overwhelmed, thinking I'm just making ends meet, raising of a family, uh, I have a house full of kids, and I'm working really hard. How am I going to take that on? And I remember saying to her, I don't have any management experience. I, I don't know why you would ask me to do that sort of thing. I'm, I'm honored, but I'm not sure I can do it. And she said, well, of course you do. You manage all those kids and you've got that house all organized. You can take this job on. You don't need anything more than that. And, uh, and she, she did provide the support uh, that I needed, but I went in with that as a caveat, that, there, that, that the priority for me, while it was to do my job, uh, like Jill, it's not quite the same when you're at the Crown's office, um, but you do have a, an incredible volume of work, and often you're given your trial briefs and you might have a ton, a stack of them, and you've got to have them ready for the next day. Um, so it is a little bit of a fight, and you do have to, uh, you have to at times scale back. Um, but it's 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 something you've got to negotiate with your uh, employer. Obviously, in private practice, uh, we've heard from Jill how it's really not mm -hmm. feasible. So it it is problematic uh, for 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 people. But I think if you have uh, members of the criminal justice system who are more sensitive to the issue that people have to find a balance, there's a little more acceptance. Certainly, if I had tried at the outset of my practice to do something like say to a judge, I'm sorry, I'm not going to be available until 10.30 or 11 o'clock tomorrow because I've got an appointment for a child or I've got some need to tend to in the family, it would not have gone over. In fact, uh, I can think of having come back as a young lawyer to my office and and having uh, my manager say, gee, I got a call from the trial lawyer today. Uh, he wanted to, me to pass on this message. Uh, the girl that was in court today, can you tell her not to wear a pantsuit before before me again? Um, so archaic, old fashioned. How long ago was and, that? Uh, 30 years ago. 30 years ago. 30 years you ago. You wouldn't hear that today. You would not hear that no. today. Okay. Um, so, so the profession has learned to be a little bit more mm. sensitive um, and I think it, people do have to, to push uh, the envelope but then we also by the same token have males who uh, are tending to take on greater responsibility in well, the home. Let, Jill, let me ask you but w w if, if you use that line today in front of let's say a female judge who maybe raised a family of her own and if you could you say to a female judge today, I need the, tomorrow's trial to start an hour late because i got to take my kid to the eye doctor? Could you do that? I don't think so. I don't think so. Hmm. In fact, I've seen cases uh, that I've worked on on appeal where the trial lawyer um, had child care issues and just didn't want court to start early, didn't want court to start at 8.30, and the trial judge said no. Man or woman? Man, a, trial a, judge. A male judge in that case. Yeah. If it had been a female judge, might there have been more understanding? Maybe. But maybe not. Maybe not. Maybe not. I think it depends. That's a personality mm -hmm. question, too. Mm -hmm. I, I feel like over time, there's been a change, an attitudinal change about that. And I think there's a, a fair degree of, like, you've got to dig in. You really got to dig in and say, this is what I've got to do. I, I can't be here until that time. But if there were one idea you could share that that would make this profession less hostile, if you like, to women who want to stay in it for the long haul, is there an idea out there that has some consensus? Aside from better funding of the legal aid plan, I would say that all criminal lawyers need to think about making women feel welcome. And that means men and women, senior men and senior women, need to offer mentorship. They need to think about referring cases to women, not just to men, mm. offering support, um, and generally being aware of casual sexist comments or casually harassing comments so that women feel more welcome in the courtroom and the system. Gotcha. Well, we hope we have whetted the public's appetite for 
uh, What You Two Do. These are but two of 18 stories in a book called Women in Criminal Justice, True Cases by and About Canadian Women and the Law. Jennifer Briscoe and Jill Presser, good of both of you to come into TVO tonight. Thanks so much. Thank, Thank you, you, Steve. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. Helping businesses stay on the right side of change with strategic thinking, insightful decisions, and business leadership. Are you on the right side of change? Ask an Ontario CPA.